Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Um, I'm going to jump straight in because I always, well, before I jump straight in, we give you a little bit about myself. Um, officially, this is, quote, an agenda. Um, we'll flex on this very much. I was just sharing with some friends from a former lifetime, not really a life ago, but nonetheless. It's incredible. I live in Charlotte. They live in Charlotte. We got to fly to New Jersey to cross paths. It's just it's totally crazy. But anyway, um, I was just sharing with them. This talk is very much brand new. Like, I was piecing this together a half hour before I walked into this room. And it's largely based on some research that we just popped out the shoot in the office of the CTO of McAfee. Um, so, you know, bear with me if I go a little bit off slides or whatever have you. So I do have an agenda, but don't hold me to it too much. Let me talk a little bit about uh, myself. First of all, um, and I like to lead with this because it, you know, sets your expectations way down. English is not my first language. My first language is Dutch. I am a Dutch citizen, was born in the Netherlands. Um, so if I fall off the stage and screw up, let's just blame it on the Dutch and, you know, keep that mum's the word between us. I will say, though, I've been a hacker for a lot of years, um, pretty much as far back as I can remember. So I remember taking apart my first piece of technology, which was a CB radio. Um, to see if I could get it to go from, I can't remember what it was called, I want to say UHF to short band, because short band had further range and, you know, really weird stuff. And my dad was like, what the hell are you doing? Because he's an accountant and he's like, you're going to kill yourself and et cetera. And I was probably seven or eight when I did that. So as long as I can remember, I've been hacking at stuff and trying to get stuff to do stuff that it was not designed for and break it or make it better according to your perspective. Um, in, as far as cybersecurity is concerned, this year marks my 27th year working, not just hacking and playing, but actually working in cybersecurity. Uh, when I came out of college, there was a year or two in there, three maybe, where I did not work in cybersecurity and I was doing what everyone else did in the 80s, which is IT. Um, but very quickly, I was like, this IT stuff sucks. That cybersecurity stuff is right up my alley. So I switched over and I never looked back. Interesting note on that, um, it's actually a good segue. Someone, is, are we recording this? I'm gonna need this recording afterwards because I'm gonna learn from this one. Um, interesting note on that, um, there's a big difference between regular IT and cybersecurity. They're often, nowadays less so, but definitely in the beginning they were kind of, you know, coalesced together somewhat, and you know, your, your IT guy would do security, and there was no separate security guy, et cetera. That's, I still see that in some of my clients, but for the most part, it's, you know, separate. But they're very, very different worlds. And an interesting side note on that, when I started, and I'm not going to say when that was, but 27 years ago, well, you can figure out when 27 years ago was. I'm not going to say how old I was then. That's what I'm not going to say. Uh, when I started working in cybersecurity, cybersecurity actually didn't even pay the bills. So I would do stuff like Exchange Server Admin and, you know, Novell Admin and, you know, Windows NT Admin and that kind of stuff. That was my job job. And on the side, I was doing cybersecurity for free because no one would pay for cybersecurity services because there were, as far as everyone knew, no cyber criminals, et cetera. We've now known that that's nonsense. You know, cyber criminals did exist then and stuff was being done, but we had little visibility into it. And on that note, I'll switch to my so-called segue. So um, in terms of the big difference or one of the big differences between cybersecurity, and bear with me if I you know, talk a little bit about the threat landscape. This is not your average, or I'm hoping this is not your average. You know, things are bad and this is why and there's a lot of malware out there and you know, people are trying to get your credit card data, et cetera. I'm going to try to take it from a more scientific perspective. Um, but because I don't know everyone in the room, I got to kind of lay a little bit of a foundation and that's, where this, that's what this is about. So the threat landscape has switched or changes very drastically. I'm sure you all know that. You know, two, three years ago, everyone was talking, five years ago maybe, everyone was talking about APTs. And we deploy, you know, next gen firewalls with IPS signatures, et cetera, because APTs were the big risk and, you know, root kits, et cetera. 
You don't hear much talk about root kits now. That's changed very drastically. Today, the objectives are really data theft and getting into your network for the point of stealing data and getting it out of your network. That's the objective nowadays. That was not the objective you know, when this thing all started. Um, step forward a little bit more, the threat landscape, and I want you to see in the graphics that the threat landscape is not just changing, it's actually growing. So whereas, and I'll give a simple example of this, if you were or are an email administrator, simplicity's sake, let's say you run Exchange version whatever, probably 2.16 is the current version, don't quote me on that, I'm not an Exchange guy anymore, um, for, your, for your environment, um, you know, if you're running Exchange on-prem in your environment and something changes and you decide, or your boss decides, hey, we're going to the cloud. You then migrate to maybe Office 365, which probably a lot of you are doing already. Um, what happens to your Exchange servers when you migrate to Office 365? What do you do with your Exchange servers? You throw them away. You deprecate them, right. They become garbage. Do you still update them? You still patch them? No. Do you still, <coughs> excuse me, build your environment and hold reckoning with the fact that you have those Exchange servers there? No, you absolutely do not. That's the whole point of moving and shifting strategy to the cloud. You can leave this behind while going forward to this. Same thing with if you were a Novell administrator, and now I'm definitely dating myself. If you switched from Novell, and pardon me for getting nerdy, but I'm assuming most of you are fairly technical, which is an LDAP-based um, directory infrastructure for keeping track of users and objects in a directory. And you know, in the 80s, early 90s, you shifted to a different um, LDAP-based, kind of pseudo-based infrastructure, like, say, Microsoft Active Directory. What did you do with your Novell servers? You shot them in the head and you threw them out. That's migration. That's change. Cybersecurity is probably the only IT-related discipline that that strategy will literally cost you your job. Because the threats of yesterday are very, very much prevalent today. As a matter of fact, last year the big threats were not Petya and WannaCry. Both of them based on an old worm, don't ask me the name of it, I don't remember the name of it, but it based on an old worm that was literally more than five years old. Cybersecurity guys, cyber criminals actually, went back, looked at the dats and the signatures that we detected, realized that vendors like McAfee, Symantec, Cisco, Microsoft, all the vendors can't just infinitely grow their signature size. They got to shrink and get some of the less rele relevant ones out so that they're not sending you a 50 gigabyte signature file every week or every day in the case of some vendors like we. We send out a signature file every day, updated. Um, so to prevent that from being huge, we got to take some stuff out of it. Cyber criminals actively research what's been taken out and how can I use what they took out. That's where technologies like AI, analytics, and machine learning, the one I want to talk about today, that's where that comes into play. So most of you have heard about machine learning technology. All of you I'm definitely going to assume. There's a couple of um, um, next-gen companies that are out there selling machine learning technology specifically for you know, endpoints on computers. I'm not going to call their names, but I'm sure you all know who I'm talking about. If not, feel free to jot down a question. I'll go as deep as you want to go during the Q&A section. Um, so literally ask whatever, well, within reason. Literally ask whatever you want. Anyway, so it keeps getting bigger, the threat landscape. The latest thing now is date, um, um, data weaponization, ransomware. And now we're seeing multi-cloud and, and multi-tenant and IoT type um, attacks, meaning it grew even bigger. What we're even starting to see now is a change in the methods of the threat landscape. So we're not just talking about, hey, I'm going to get you a file, and that file has a bad thing in it. Now we're seeing, I'm going to get you a fileless attack. So there's literally no file there. I'm literally just sending you a blob of encrypted text that when that text hits your PowerShell command line, it runs, and that text will pull down the attack or do whatever it needs to do. That's the, the, the plus and minus value of the tools that are very useful to us, like PowerShell and PSExec, are the same tools that come back to bite us in the butt. Um, am I saying disable PowerShell or PSExec in your environment? You can't. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you try, you will probably find out the hard way that someone in your environment is using it for some critical task, but I'll dive deeper into that. So not only has the threat space grown, 
the methods that we use in that threat space or that occur in that threat space, because I'm not a cyber criminal, so I shouldn't say we use them, they have expanded significantly. How do we address that? Before I get into why machine learning sucks, I'm going to step into kind of the pseudo solution. We did some studies and we came up with this principle um, called Grobman's Curve. And by the way, if you're standing by waiting for me to pitch you some product or something, you're at the wrong talk. I don't think I mentioned a product anywhere within this deck whatsoever. I could care, my sales guys, I don't see them, so I'm going to do as if they're not here. I could care less whose product you buy. I purposely took away all branding from this other than the bright red color, so you probably should know who it is I work for. I think the gentleman said it when he brought me up. Most platforms, most vendors have tools that do what I'm about to describe now. Um, how well they do it or not, we can have a, a fundamental conversation around that, but this is not a product. This is a strategy that I'm trying to get you to wrap your heads around. The strategy says, our studies, and this is not a marketing slide per se, this is actual visualization of data that we extracted from you know, our studies in the lab and samples and throwing it at stuff, et cetera. Our studies showed that threats hit, and I think I can show you where is my cursor, right? I, by the way, this is freaking awesome. Absolutely, every time I come here, I'm totally amazed by this simple little Logitech pointer. Anyway, thank you guys. You've literally changed my life as a presenter. Um, back to what I was saying. Um, so threats hit here. And this is the efficacy of the threat versus the time that the threat exists. So what Grobman's curve tries to demonstrate or visualize is that threats peak when they come out and the efficacy of not just the threat but the tool that detects that threat wanes over time. That is a critical difference in cybersecurity versus everything else because, for example, machine learning was applied to weather and, and innovation as a general, not even machine learning, innovation was applied to automobiles. You know, like now, the car that I drove here in, not my car, mind you, don't get it twisted, I drive a Ford. The car that I drove here in was a pretty white little Tesla. Tesla is unlike any car that you've seen, and the parts on it are completely different than the parts on my Ford that I drive reluctantly when I get back home, not going to want to drive my Ford at all anymore now. Thank you, SHI, for that. Um, either way, that technology has changed, it's grown significantly, and the efficacy of that technology has improved and it stays high. We don't expect that tomorrow the batteries in that Tesla are going to start performing less other than age. The battery technology of Teslas is going to remain high until they come out with some other battery type technology or wind based or whatever and that's going to be better and then we're going to shift to that. The, the, the reason for that is roads are not actively trying to counteract what we're doing with automobiles. Just like weather, where we apply machine learning, is not actively trying to evade your weather guy detecting how accurately the weather is going to be. Cyber criminals, on the other hand, are actively out there studying, OK, how are you detecting my attacks? Oh, you're using a FireEye device? No swipe against FireEyes, it's just a device. You're using a checkpoint device or a Palo Alto device? Gotcha. I'm going to get a Palo Alto device, and I'm going to study how it assesses my threat, and I'm going to build an evasion for it. That's what cyber criminals do. And because of that is why that curve wanes that way. How do you fix that? Or how do you, you can't really fix it, how do you address it? One of the ways you can address that is what is called the platform approach. So rather than using one single technology, you use layered technologies that correlate back to each other to where it's not just one technology that's doing the detection, but you have two or three or four that are all detecting it at different parts of the attack, and that's how you prevent um, things. That's how you try to stretch that curve out a little bit to make the, the, the curve, the efficacy curve of your tool, you want to make it increase a little bit so your tool is maximum effective for as long as possible, and one of the ways to do that is with bundling technologies together via technology teaming. Um, another one is via countermeasure resiliency. And that leads us to why machine learning in particular sucks. And the reason this is important is because just about every single person in here is being sold something machine learning based right now. Um, 
If it's not an endpoint detection tool, it's probably a tool in your sock. Probably someone is telling you if we apply machine learning magic, poof, pang, boom, to your logs and your SIM, your SIM is going to be better. So machine learning, if you go to RSA, DEF CON, Black Hat, Gartner, week after the next, whatever, that's all you're going to be hearing. And you've been hearing that for two or three years. I'm going to try to show you what the flaw in that premise is. So the slide, the, 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 the picture that you're seeing up there, disregard the words adversarial machine learning. Um, the picture that you see, as a matter of fact, let me step back. That right there is actual data that we threw at a machine learning model that we built out in our lab. So we built a detection model to detect letters, words, and scribbles, and pick out of the letters, words, and scribbles which ones are actual characters that we can translate into something. If you look at this, you see the red little dots? The red little dots, and this is super nerdy, I'm sorry, but I'm a nerd, it is what it is. The red little dots are the places where the machine learning model failed. So looking at this, ballpark it for me. What was the success ratio of this? Give me a number, roughly. Guy up in the front. Rough. Yeah, 95, 90%, 80%. Consider that good. It's a pretty decent eff efficacy rate, right? Well, you're a hard guy, but nonetheless, you're wrong. It is good. Just kidding. Um, it's, it's passable. It's OK. Um, granted, if you're getting 10,000 threats a day and you're 95% efficacy, you know, there's, a couple, there's a significant value number of threats that get through. But most tools are truly around out the box, normal configuration around this type of efficacy. The problem with this is the following. We took that study and we did this to it. We took, and you can see you know, throughout the numbers, there were a couple of nines there. We took a couple of the nines and we added in, look really carefully, where's my cursor? Right there. You can see around there, you see some little glitches around the nine? And you see some more glitches around the nine? Oh, interesting. So it's a different screen. There we go. So you see some glitches around the nine there and some less glitches around that nine. Not super bright, but you can see there's a big difference between here. This is a nice crisp nine. This has some splotches around it. And this is even a little more splotchy. Now, to the humans, what are those things up there? Lee, what are those things? Those are three nines, right? Three nines to any human in here unless you have a serious eyewear problem. Now, the model, the machine learning model, this is what happened when we introduced, and those are literally bits of data. This is what happened when we introduced bits of data to the machine learning model. At the beginning, and to avoid this, I'm going to point. At the beginning, we were at just about what you said, 80-ish, 90%-ish. We introduced a couple of glitches to it. Efficacy dropped by less than three bits. Efficacy dropped to 40, 40 or 50%. Time passed a little bit. We added a couple more bits. To every human in here, it's still a nine. The machine learning model dropped to almost 0% efficacy from introducing just that handful of bits. And that is why your machine learning model sucks. Because you might think introducing a few bits is not a big deal. But let me give you a hypothetical example. Again, I'm going to get kind of technical here, but it is what it is. Um, if I gave you a script that went through your Windows environment and searched for every works, a PowerShell script, and it searched for every workstation in your environment, and it tried to find wherever SMB version 1 was enabled, and it switched that off to disabled. Is that a good script or a bad script? Anyone. Good script or bad script? A script that will find SMB v, don't be shy. I'm genuinely waiting for an answer back. A script that will find SMB v1 in your environment, find it, identify it, and disable it on every single workstation where it's, where it's enabled. Is that a good script or a bad script? That is, I can't hear you, but that's an awesome script. Why? Because SMB v1 is an old deprecated protocol that Microsoft coded X amount of years ago for sharing files. SMB stands for um, Samba, file sharing, something or the other. But it's the way Windows systems share files up and allow you to have shared folders. The problem with SMB v1, it doesn't do authentication in a secure manner. So SMB v1 is what allowed WannaCry and Petya last year to spread throughout environments like wildfire. And you guys here have heard me speak about this before. We had a client that um, I think within 90 seconds 
um, I want to say 70 or 50 or 60 or a lot of their global environment was impacted by not Petya in seconds. So the, the ability for something to spread east and west in your environment is a bad thing. That was because of SMB version 1. Microsoft has probably five, six, seven, eight years ago updated SMB v1 to SMB, I want to say v3 now or so, and it's significantly fixed. But because we all in the, in the IT space, not cybersecurity specifically, like to build technologies with what we call backwards compatibility so that in case you're running an old version of X Windows Server, Windows NT, God willing, none of you are running Windows NT, but you get what I mean, or whatever server you're running, you can run the new versions next to it, and the old versions can still play on the network. That's why we do backwards compatibility. And that's why Microsoft didn't kill SMB v1. They left it to the users to say, I'm going to be diligent, I'm going to get upgraded servers, and I'm going to remove SMB v1. Turns out, six years after SMB v3 came out, last year we found out there were millions of nodes around the globe still running SMB v1 in environments. So that script to go out and detect SMB v1 and turn it off, that would be a very helpful script. Paint a second picture for you. What if I wrote you a script, same script, PowerShell, same language, Windows environments, and it goes out in your whole environment, it looks for SMB v1, and it enables it? What are the differences between those two scripts? Not only that, in terms of the technological difference between the scripts, literally one byte of data. I change literally one zero to a one. So the switch where I say disable SMB v1, I change that to enable SMB v1. One byte of difference. And that tool that was now a good tool to help you protect your environment now becomes a terrible tool, like a NotPetya, that helps something spread throughout your environment. That's those small minuscule differences is what attackers do. And those small differences, no matter what your security vendor tells you, whether it's McAfee, Symantec, Silence, CrowdStrike, I don't care who they are, if they tell you that their key is going to be detection before bad stuff happens and they're going to detect always, they are lying to you because of this. Because I can make one bit change and I, will, I guarantee you I will blow through all of your defenses. So how do you solve that? Let's get into it. Obviously, I inferred that strongly already. It's by a platform. But let me be, dive a little bit deeper into it. Let's say I told you, you know, we saw the threat landscape earlier. I, I, I framed it up for you. Let's say the blue box is this new supersonic hot and funky to tool that I've just built out in my lab. And it detects 100% efficacy for that amount of the threat landscape. You think I should release that tool to market for sale? Is that a, you know, should I quit my job and go and do a little startup, get some VC funding, and hey, I got the tool that does that. You think that's, is that a good tool? Yes or no? It's a trick question. You really don't have enough context to know whether it's a good tool because you don't know, maybe I have a tool that already solves the other red blocks, but this tool only solves those three blue red blocks. And that is the critical key to cybersecurity. If you are not, looking at the broad picture of your tools and the attacks that are coming to you, and more importantly, if you're not looking at how the tools speak to each other, you're missing out and you're leaving vulnerabilities in your environment. Give a good example. This is, again, actual visualized data of attacks we ran against you know, an environment with some security tools running on it. What I want you to notice, notice there are gaps, like in the yellow. You see the gaps in the blue. You see the gaps, et cetera. <clears throat> what I want you to notice is that every one of those, assume each one of those is a separate protective tool. So one of them is a machine learning model. One of them is signatures. One of them is HIPS, um, host base IPS rules, et cetera. By layering them together, I am able to give you a full protection of final protection where everything is caught. But you notice some is caught by the red, some is caught by the blue. A smaller percentage might be caught by the yellow. But all are equally important because I, if, if I had let just the yellow through, and this gentleman doesn't like 90% efficacy, if I would let just that 5% of the yellow through, I guarantee you that 5% of the yellow is probably something bad. Because what have we found with bad threats in environments nowadays? The few threats, those are the dangerous ones. 
the ones that are pounding your firewalls and your IPSs and your, your EPOs, et cetera, with thousands of hits per day, largely noise. That you need a tool that filters out the noise, but largely noise. The dangerous ones are the one or two or three that are cre specifically created and targeted for you. And in terms of context, do not get it twisted. Again, cloud changes things for us from a cybersecurity perspective. For example, some of our tools, all of our tools now, can be deployed via the cloud. So if you don't want to build, you know, buy firewalls and put firewalls and IPSs in place, et cetera, and you're very cloud-based, you could do all of that via our cloud and not even have to invest in infrastructure. The same way the security vendors are leveraging the cloud, it's the exact same way cyber criminals are leveraging the cloud. I can, in one of these talks, I promise you the next talk I'm going to actually do this. I can go to the dark web right now with a Tor browser and for 70 bucks, as a matter of fact, I'll give you an even better example. One of the things we stumbled across in labs this past weekend, a dark site in the UK is selling, no, I'm sorry, a dark site in the UK is selling personal identifiable information. So names, ID numbers, much like a social security number, um, addresses, birth dates, first, last, middle name, mother's maiden name, in a bundle of, peep this number, 200 million Japanese citizens. Bald, park me an estimate how much you think that costs. This site in the dark web, UK, is selling the entire batch of 200 million citizens for 150 US dollars, translated into Bitcoin, which is a, a fraction of a Bitcoin. That's, the, that's how cheap it is for if you want to go and collect some identities to go do some crap with, you could literally buy the, because 200 million is more than the entire population of Japan. You can Google that later. So they have literally collected Japanese people from all over the world, found their data, and dumped it in. Why? Because somebody who does something for a lot of Japanese um, people got penetrated. We don't know who it was yet, but just like the target breach of a couple of years ago, everyone on the dark web was like, eh, this looks suspicious. Suddenly credit card numbers have gone from a couple thousand to millions. Somebody got breached. I'm, I'm promising you, you're going to read about some entity in Japan having been breached probably in the next couple of weeks to a month. Why? Because we're seeing the evidence of it on the dark web. So I say that to say, same way the cloud helps us from security, the cloud helps cyber criminals as well. They can now get data and sell it crazy easy. Blockchain, blockchain is the best. Cryptocurrency, all crypto, eh, don't take this, take this with a grain of salt. From my perspective, all cryptocurrency and blockchain did is made an easier venue or easier vector for cyber criminals to transfer money without being detected. That's Say what you want about blockchain and how awesome it is and how you went and you know, emptied out your 401k to go and buy Bitcoin. I hope none of you did that because you're probably not happy right now, but I have friends that actually did that and I was begging them, please don't do it, you're gonna regret it. But as awesome as it seemed last year around Thanksgiving, from my perspective, right today, and I'm not saying this isn't gonna change in the future, blockchain and cryptocurrency are more bad than good. That, and the reason I said take that with a grain of salt, I'm not saying that to say they're gonna be shut down. Because if I went back 20 years, I would say the internet, or forget internet, bulletin board systems, the precursor to the internet, was more porn than anything else. The internet was more spam, and even today is more spam and porn, and there are numbers that you can quantify that on, than anything else. That doesn't mean because something morally ambiguous, or in some cases bad, is what's driving the technology that is going to stop necessarily. I'm just saying, as of today, cryptocurrency is cute, but not so useful for us, very useful for cyber criminals. Um, I can find a ransomware site, ransomware as a service, and I, I, I really should have done this live. It, it's phenomenal. They have 800 numbers that you can buy their service and say, hey, I want to ransom you know, my friends from the law firm in Charlotte. I'm not going to call their name because I don't want anyone to get any ideas. I want to ransom them. They will literally take 24 hours go out and do an assessment of their IP addresses and everything else, um, determine what type of technology they use at their border, find a way to penetrate that, create a custom piece of malware for it, and then attack them with a piece of ransomware. They'll give you service level agreements. They will guarantee you that within, I think it's seven or eight days, they will get at least X amount, so if they're, they're X amount percent of their environment will be ransomed off. They will guarantee that. 
Um, they can't guarantee that the customer is going to pay, because sometimes the customer has good backups. Hint, the solution for ransomware is do your freaking backups. But anyway, maybe the customer has good backups, so they won't pay. But you do that with 10 customers. You're going to find someone that had something critical that they need that they didn't back up. And it's a business model. I can, and they have telephone numbers, literally, where you can call and say, hey, um, the ransomware, it's not triggering. I'm not seeing nodes popping up, or a, a node popped up, and I didn't see the Bitcoin currency come in. It's literally, service level agreements, very professional. I don't mean guys out in India or Africa, you know, the African prince. I mean, you know, like guys in Kansas are picking up the phone with a professional accent. Hi, my name is Billy Bob. How can I help you? Um, ransomware or us? I'm, I, am, I kid you not. That entire service to attack X law firm in North Carolina, a couple hundred bucks. That's the power of the cloud. So if you think that you're the only ones using the cloud to you know, make your business better, cyber criminals are on it just as much. And that's why just your plain old machine learning model, it's not sufficient. You have to couple it with other technologies that speak together. You can't just say, I'm going to roll out the best from Microsoft Defender, plus the best from Silence, plus the best from Darktrace, all solid c competitors, all solid vendors, and the best from McAfee, just to keep it all fair. And yay, I got the best from all three of them, so I'm good to go. No. Why? Because the correlation of technologies is just as important, and in my opinion, probably more so important than their efficacy. If you have the best of all products, but those products don't communicate with each other, you suffer a problem of either false positives or waning detection and loss of re um, resources. Why? Because the boxes in your environment only have X amount of memory and X amount of resources and X amount of CPU cycles. So if I'm throwing 10 things on it to do security, what about the Word and the Excel and the Salesforce.com that your users need to use? They're not going to perform well because security is hogging all of the resources. That's why you need tools to speak to each other. Is there a benefit, and I'm going to close on this because I want to leave some time for Q&A. Is there a benefit to two tools or five tools or seven tools on an endpoint, all scanning an attack and all detecting that that attack is bad? Is that good or bad? That's terrible. Why? Because that's a waste of resources. After one detects it as bad, and the second one validates it, hey, yeah, point one said it was bad. I went and double checked it, and I see some artifacts, it's bad. Let me just go ahead and block it. You need to stop checking that. Matter of fact, you need to tell the rest of your environment, this is no longer unknown. This is no longer a day zero, because we tested it over here, and there's tools that can do that automated for you. And we now know it is bad. Go ahead and tell the rest of the environment it's bad. That is how you mitigate your sucky machine learning models. Um, show a little bit of the correlation paradox. This is in terms of how, don't worry with the math and the numbers. This is in terms of how coverage aligns to confidence. And all I'm trying to, and these are actual formulas. You can write them down if you want. Sorry, I think we'll share the deck out afterwards. So you can go and you know, call BS on this if you want. But all this shows is it's, it's mathematically much more difficult to detect something with a level of confidence than it is to just detect something. And that leads to threat detection without false positives is not just hard, but it is incredibly hard. And that is what you want in your environment. You want threat detection with no false positives. And I have a couple more slides, but I'm going to, like I said, veer off of the slides. And I'm going to kind of summarize it by this. So, you're probably going to ask me, so how do we implement this, Greg? How do we protect our environments against this scary, ever-changing, ever-growing, ever-complex threat um, landscape that attackers are attacking us with and actively trying to evade how we are protecting them? How do we address that? I'll give you two ways you address it. One, inferred that already. You need an environment that speaks with each other inside of your environment. So when one part detects something bad, it should tell everyone else. But I'll give you the second one that's, in my opinion, even today not so much more important, but mark my words. What I do at my job is technical strategy. So I don't sell stuff. That's why I could say stuff like I don't care whether you buy McAfee or not. But I will, I, my job is to see and detect and predict what, where is this going to go. Why? Because in hockey, 
You always want to skate to not where the puck is. You want to skate to where the puck is going to be. So as a company, we invest a lot of time and resource and effort and smart people, smart, way smarter than I am, in detecting where is that puck headed. Because we need to be there waiting for it when it gets there. Where's the cyber threat landscape headed? Because that's where we're aiming for. We're not aiming for where it is today. And where it's headed and where we are aiming for today is you're probably going to have a time soon where stuff like antivirus and next gen endpoint protection, et cetera, is probably going to be significantly less. If there's salespeople in here, I know there are. You want to start focusing on not selling or decreasing how much you focus and start selling stuff like endpoint and technology and next gen and, and you know, silence and EDR. That's all cute and stuff. You know where it's going to head? It's going to head to your SOC. In the, can't put a time on it, but in the, and this is not a McAfee opinion. This is a Greg Richardson opinion, so no one called my boss and say that Greg just said that. But either way, and if you do, I'll say you're lying out of the skin of your teeth. Anyway, um, either way, I see in the next handful of years, and I'm going to end on this, you're probably not going to have much endpoint protection tools running on endpoints anymore. You're probably going to have one or two powerful visibility tools. You know why? Because the same way the cyber criminals are using the cloud, the vendors are gearing up to use the cloud as well. If you one anecdotal piece of information, we have a cloud we call the GTI cloud, Global Threat Intelligence Cloud. And why do we use so many acronyms in this industry? I'll never understand, but that's a conversation for another day. Our Global Threat Intelligence Cloud has existed for more than eight years. Today, our Global Threat Intelligence Cloud, and that's the cloud where all of the McAfee products all around the world, from mobile devices, the, the 40 million Samsung devices that it comes out the factory with McAfee on it, to PCs, to Macs, to Linux boxes, to servers, all of those check in there whenever they find a file that they haven't seen before. So if it's not in our signatures, they check into Global Threat Intelligence. Literally hundreds of millions of devices around the world. That Global Threat Intelligence Cloud, it's a cloud-based database, you know, publicly accessible. It gets more hits per day, minute, hour, second than Facebook does. And that was even before Facebook crapped the bed a couple of weeks ago with their whole Cambridge Analytica nonsense. Even before their traffic probably is dropping as we speak, we got more hits in our cloud than Facebook and Google. That's how big that cloud is. So, and we're not the only vendor that has that. All the security vendors have that. That is where we're going to be focusing our energy. And that is where the industry is probably going to go. Why? Because I can throw way more, way more horsepower at stuff like analytics and machine learning and AI up in the cloud where I can tell it, take you know, X amount of petaflops of, of technology and processors and RAM and whatever else have you that you don't have on the endpoint. And if I can just get the contextual threat intel from your endpoint on, hey, these are the processes that are starting up, like right this second, and I can analyze that up in my cloud, I guarantee you my efficacy rate is going to be way better than anything you could do on your nice little Pentium i7 blah, 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 blah endpoint. That's why we're migrating to the cloud, and that's where I think it's going to be in the future. You're going to be selling, or you should be selling, and as customers looking at tools that make your SOC, your security operations team and operations, the, the group of people that responds to incidents, that's where you're going to be starting to see a lot more of your threats. It's not going to come from, oh, this tool on my endpoint detected it. It's going to come from someone in my SOC or some tool in my SOC that's probably getting data off of some cloud somewhere, did some huge analytics on stuff like what we call the Superman event, which is where a user logs in in Peking, China. And you know, they're downloading some data. Five seconds later, that same user logs in in Charlotte, North Carolina. Is the user Superman? If user not equals to Superman, we have a problem. That's called a Superman event. If you are not doing analytics of geolocation as well, because you realize up until this point, the user hasn't done anything bad. All they've done is logged in. They might just be looking at Word documents. No malware involved. Nothing a signature can find. But simply because the user logged in simultaneously or near simultaneously from two places that are geographically different, a good SOC analytics tool can tell you there is a problem right now with that user. Because what the cyber criminals are transmitting and selling and trading now 
is not just malware. It's your user credentials. That's one of the things that they're busy trying to steal right now. And how do you address valid user credentials connecting to your network and just copying files that they work with every day? Some might say DLP. I'm going to say no. It's going to be analytics at a SOC level. That's how you solve it. And that's what addresses the fact that your machine learning sucks. Five minutes left, almost to the second. I'm going to open it up for some Q&A. Um, I am sweating like a pig. So I'm going to stop walking around now. In case you can't tell, and I'm waiting for you to ask questions. In case you can't tell, I like this stuff. I get very passionate about cybersecurity, hence the sweat and nerves and everything else. Any questions, thoughts, comments, or you're going to give me five minutes in my day back, and I'm going to be very grateful. That is awesome. Sir? Oh, wait, wait, what? Sorry, question. One second. Do you need him to use a microphone? If you repeat the question, it should go that way. I'll repeat the question. You don't need to use the microphone. Go ahead. Excellent question. Um, so the question was, I spoke about products working together. Are we seeing the vendor market, so our part of the market, actually genuinely start to work together? Some ways, yes. Some ways, no. Candidly, <coughs> some ways, yes. Most ways, not nearly enough. And that has to do with, again, purely my opinion, what I call a disproportionate level of maturity for the age. So they often say men mature slower than women do. Cybersecurity industry must be a man because it's about 30 years old or so. It still is immature like a five-year-old. So there's still the, the, the average posture of the cybersecurity vendor is, shh, I have a great detection methodology. I'm not going to tell anyone. This strategy that I laid out today goes contra that. So the vendors that open up their arms, and there's more than, it's not just a, hey, McAfee does this. There's two or three good vendors that will open their arms and say, Mr. Customer, we will help you build an infrastructure, a solution, not just a one product that communicates with each other. You're not seeing, it's not the most of the industry that does it, but there's a handful of what I consider thought leaders that definitely do do that. So you can identify them in the industry very well. Listen to any vendor that talks about stuff like bus and you know, crossing competitive borders, partnership programs. The problem with partnership programs, you got to kind of peel back the kimono a little bit. You got you to really dig a little bit deeper because everyone now will say, oh, I got a partnership program. What are you partnering on? What are you sharing? Are you willing to share with me the second your technology detects something bad so that I can assume it as bad as well? Because if you're not willing to do that and all you're willing to do is consume when my technology detects something bad and then you can benefit from it, yeah, you got a partnership system, but that's one of those marriages that's destined for divorce. It's got to be not tech related at all. Why do divorces happen? Everyone says, oh, it was her fault, it was his fault. You know why divorces happen? It's always 100% one party's fault and 100% the other party's fault. Because it needs to be 100-100. It can't be me putting 50, and I'm once divorced, not divorced any longer, so women, back down, back way down. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm once divorced, I will say, um, it's always, it has to be 100-100. And that's how a partnership at a cybersecurity level needs to be. It needs to be 100-100. I'll give you an example of that really um, um, crisp, hopefully. If I deploy, say, a Cisco ASA firepower firewall in my environment, and that Cisco ASA detects something bad, the second, the nanosecond it detects something bad, the McAfee technology exists, and this is a real example with Cisco, that it can take that threat intelligence and say, hey, literally that quick, nanoseconds later, Cisco, you're not on the endpoints, you're only on the edge of the network, all of the endpoints now know this file equals bad. So that if that file happened to be on the endpoint because someone transmitted it, you know, they were in a Starbucks or whatever, they still get the active protection of the fact that you've invested in Cisco and Cisco detected something with their Cisco awesome power or whatever they want to call it. Whether that was Cisco or Checkpoint, that paradigm needs to hold and vice versa equally. I could tell you as well, if our machine learning, sexiness, whatever on the endpoint detects something bad, 
We have the ability to share it that quickly with your Palo Alto firewalls, your checkpoint firewalls, your Cisco firewalls. And I don't mean 15 minutes later. I mean nanoseconds later. Because if I detect something is bad in your environment and you've paid for it, you probably trust it. So why the heck are you not sharing that with the rest of your environment? So is it the norm? No. Can it be done? 100% today it can be done. And I'd suggest you look for vendors that speak towards that direction. Any other questions? Thank you, sir.